You know, the most common question that I hear is, uh, is this bill going to chill free speech and threaten legitimate acti activism in Canada? In particular, we're concerned that Conservatives will apply these new powers to First Nations, environmental activists who stand in the way of projects like Enbridge Northern Gateway and Kinder Morgan. I know that concern is what's brought a lot of you here tonight as well. As I said in Parliament, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip was arrested on Burnaby Mountain over the Kinder Morgan issue, and what new threats to privacy and liberty would he have faced if this bill had been law then? Well, to talk about some of these questions, we have an amazing activist who's worked everywhere from the United Nations Refugee Program in Uganda to community organizations right here in Victoria. She's now an instructor in social justice at the University of Victoria and a researcher into nonviolence, social movements, and collective action. Ladies and gentlemen, Laurel Collins. great to see such a great turnout. And I do want to talk about this threat to dissent in Canada. And there's been a lot of conversation about the bill, and I'm just going to recap some of the things that are relevant uh, to this topic in particular. And the first one is this expanded um, kind of spying powers of CSIS and um, that the sharing that will happen. Next is this piece around disruption. I'm going to come back to that. Um, the next one is free speech. And then also these nine descriptions of what undermines the security of Canada. Um, and already mentioned in there was critical infrastructure and the kind of interference with the economic security of Canada, but also covert foreign operations or um, influences is in there as well. And when you link that to the same kind of discourse and language around uh, foreign funded radicals, we start to get this really scary picture of the direction that Canada is headed. So starting with that disruption piece, and so it, as um, Randall pointed out, it stops, and, and Reg as well, it stops at the uh, kind of rape, torture, murder, things that it could actually include and things that other national security agencies do in terms of disruption techniques are breaking and entering, uh, smear campaigns, it's also um, hacking into computers and deleting or uh, swiping, like kind of uh, deleting everything on them, draining bank accounts. So these are just some of the disruption techniques that are possible <laughs> under this new bill. Um, and then moving on to free speech. And so this bill actually introduces kind of a new speech crime, which is the advocating, kind of encouraging terrorism. And we do actually have speech crimes in Canada. The um, hate speech is a crime, but it's limited to public discourse. So this new kind of speech crime would be public and private, which becomes a even more scary when you think about CSIS's new powers. And it also, it's not only people who are intending to um, incite terrorism, it's also people who are, and this is a word from the bill, reckless um, in, the outcome of their communications. And then, when you think about that in connection with what they're considering uh, to be undermining Canadian security, which includes uh, people who are interfering with critical uh, infrastructure and interfering with the financial stability um, of Canada, then you can see the kind of connections that we're, we're making and the impacts for Indigenous communities, for em the environmental movement as a whole. So yeah, I also want to talk about immediately after those kind of nine things that constitute what undermines Canada's uh, security, there's a little caveat that says that this doesn't include lawful protest, advocacy, um, dissent, and, and self-expression, or artistic, yeah, exactly, artistic expression. And so um, the key word in there is lawful, because what unlawful dissent includes are sit-ins, um, marches without permits. Um, if you think of the civil rights movements um, and how many of these really important moments were unlawful acts of civil disobedience, and all of these unlawful acts of civil disobedience can now be kind of put under CSIS's new powers. Um, also, wildcat strikes, so um, strikes that aren't uh, according to traditional labor laws. 
Um, so yeah, and then I want to add to that just the recently leaked RCMP documents and the kind of language um, that they're describing environmental activists and indigenous activists. They're calling them um, violent Aboriginal extremists and uh, anti-petroleum extremists or anti-Canadian petroleum extremists, <laughs> which it kind of boggles the mind. They're lumping in non-violent um, civil disobedience and uh, people who are engaged in this kind of uh, peaceful protesting with what undermines the security of Canada. And it's, it's kind of terrifying. Um, and then I also wanted to bring out a couple things from those leaked RCMP documents. If you have a chance, there's, I think it's just 12 pages, take a look at it. It's titled something along the lines of threats to critical infrastructure in Canada. Um, and they, I mean, for the first thing is they, they kind of call into question the legitimacy of climate change, uh, which is scary that the RCMP documents are doing this. Um, and they also focus on Northern BC and New Brunswick. And so specifically indigenous communities who are fighting against pipelines, who are fighting against fracking. Um, and they, they label those as hotspots for this threat to Canadian security. Um, and so that kind of ties in to this, how this bill is also undermining Section 35, the rights of the Aboriginal peoples. And I'm not qualified to talk about it, but I think that this is also a, another missing piece in this conversation, where we need to be thinking about how Aboriginal rights are undermined by this bill. Um, yeah, so those, all of those things. All of those things uh, paint a really scary picture for dissent in Canada. And I'm really interested in kind of how social movements um, develop and evolve. Social movements aren't just these kind of strategic things that um, block certain policies or um, projects that we don't want to happen. They're also about forging collective identities. They're about building community. And these bills are threatening that. They're, they are actually undermining First of all, who wants to be involved in collective action? Because all of a sudden, you are potentially going to be spied upon, potentially going to be detained without charge. It, it makes it much more risky for people to join in these actions. Then, if you actually do decide to, and you're building community with people, and you're afraid that maybe if your friend is a CSIS agent, or um, that CSIS is planting agent provocateurs in your movement, it, it undermines that community that we're building. And then for the people who are on the front lines, and these are mainly indigenous communities um, and environmental activists who are there risking that, putting themselves in danger, they are then going to be criminalized with this bill. Um, and I, I, I hate to paint this really scary, bleak picture. And so I want to end on um, a quote that is from Mahatma Gandhi. And, he was engaged in so many unlawful acts of civil disobedience. The Salt March is kind of the one that sticks out the most. Um, but he said, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they fight you, and then you win.